Welcome back to Dead Good Book Reviews. I'm Judith and you're watching another review video here on the channel. This is another rapid fire review where I try and review a new release within 24 hours of reading it. I am within two hours of reading it this time, so feeling pretty smart. We are talking about a late September release, so while I'm filming this on the 6th of September, you should probably be watching this a little bit later in the month, unless you're a patron. But what are we talking about? You've seen the title, you've read the thumbnail, we're going to be talking about Neon Yang's The Genesis of Misery. Look at this cover, for starters. Let's just judge the book by the cover for a moment. Amazing. I may have to buy a physical copy just so I can own this. I was sent a digital review copy of this book for free from the publisher via NetGalley. Nobody's paying me to talk about books and all opinions are my own. I'm going to keep this as spoiler free as humanly possible. If you do want to go in knowing absolutely nothing, click away now. Come back when you've read it. We'll talk then. And I will link the story graph for the book below in case you want to check any user generated content warnings. Yeah, this is the first one of these videos where I'm filming it in advance. Uh, and usually I get like a little bit of time to look up some author interviews and so such, but uh, this time I'm just winging it. The book isn't out for a while. I don't know if I'm going to have more opinions later on. It's interesting. Editing Judith may have to be brought in to add stuff in. I don't know. This is the first book in the Null Void Chronicles, which is a trilogy that Neon Yang is set to produce. This is their first full-length novel. I have actually read three of their four novellas in the Tensorate series. I still need to read the fourth one and I'm kind of thinking maybe I should pivot from my TBR and just read that this week because it would be it would be fitting with reading this but I probably will stick to my TBR. By the time you're watching this maybe I've read it. But yes, first full-length novel and it is a sci-fi which is very exciting. The Tensorate series was kind of a fantasy meets technology kind of story and this feels much more like a sci-fi meets religion and that kind of thing. We'll get onto the plot in just a moment. Just last few details, as far as I know it is out on the 27th of September and it's coming out from Tor. The way that this has been pitched is that it is a reimagining of Joan of Arc but in space and I think that to a degree, yes. I think a portion of that, a portion of that is marketing spiel. Just a little bit, because I don't think it, it gets into the gender politics as much as like the Joan of Arc story does. Because uh, in this we have a very kind of queer norm world. Our main character is non-binary, or a Nixon as it's known, at least a portion of it's known in the world. It's very diverse in terms of gender identity and so such, so there's a lot of different terms. So I don't know if it got into Joan of Arc in that way, but it is a main character being called by an angel. In fact, no. Let me tell you the plot and we'll get the Joan of Arc out of it. So Misery is our main character uh, and she is in a situation where she is believed to be a messiah, being called by an angel, uh, sort of this space angel version of it. Sci-fi is hard to explain, bear with me, uh, to defend them against the heretics. However, Misery is pretty sure that this is a delusion. Uh, that she is having because she is going void mad, which is a thing you can be in this world. Uh, and yet she has to kind of keep playing along, otherwise things are going to go terribly wrong and she ends up caught up with a rebel princess. There's giant space robots. It's a whole thing. An immersive electrifying space fantasy in Yang's debut novel is full of high-tech space battles and political machinations, starring a queer and diverse array of pilots, princesses and prophetic heirs. And apparently the dog who wants to sit in my lap. That was possibly one of the worst explanations for a book I've ever done. Um, I, we'll come into it. I hope that I haven't completely put you off through my explanation. I found this book enjoyable for the most part. I think I ended up giving it about a four star rating, which is a pretty solid. Uh, I enjoyed this. Didn't completely blow my mind, but a pretty good read. I really need to sort out my rating system at some point. It's by the by. Um, overall, had a good time. I have a few things that I really loved, a few things that I thought were less good. Let's start with what I really loved. I really loved Misery as a character. I think it's so interesting. Um, the way that her mind works and changes throughout the story was fascinating to me. And she's one of those characters where I just know that her at the beginning of the trilogy, her in this book one, and her at the end of the trilogy, it's going to be fascinating. Misery uses they, she pronouns, by the way, uh, and the book primarily uses her for her. So I'm going to try and use that, but I may use them interchangeably. Who knows? So yeah, a fascinating character. Uh, and I think as somebody who was raised very religious in a very religious environment and who can uh, parrot religious language in a very similar way to the way that Misery can. I found her very relatable as a character and I really like a lot of the choices that she makes in the story and just generally I think she's a really powerful protagonist. I won't say she's like as accessible and relatable as some other protagonists that I have read. Uh, I think she takes a little bit of 
of getting used to and she changes a lot even in this one book so you have to get used to kind of flowing through the story with misery and just kind of meeting meeting them where they're at still very much enjoyed it and uh, i just liked that her relationships with various people were were interesting yeah fascinating character really uh Really looking forward to seeing where they go throughout the series. So a main character is always good. There's a lot of excellent side characters. The rebel princess we've mentioned is very cool. We get a lot of kind of uh, meeting the crew and the group and finding out secrets about them and find out information about them. That's something I actually really enjoy in sci-fi. I like that structure of meet the person, find out their backstory, help them through this. And the added religious flair that this story has makes that kind of extra interesting. I would say I think it's probably the characters that will stick with me most in this story. I would need to reread it to get the sense of the plot before picking up the next one unless it had a summary. But let's talk about the plot very briefly. I love the setup of having this messianic character and this idea of being a fraud uh, and having to find your way through and being sort of against the Empire but having to convince the Empire that you're working with them. It's not a revolution story but it is and um, I just found it a really tense story. I think what's interesting about this plot is that it definitely jumps from thing to thing. I think it's in three parts, if I'm remembering correctly, and I should remember because it was very recently. I think it's in three or four parts, and each part is very different from the other. And it's interesting looking back on the Tenseret series, which I read all in one go, at least the first three. Neon Yang does have this tendency to write novellas, and it's interesting that the novel kind of reads as three separate chunks. I don't know, it's not a typical three-act structure to the story, which works for me because I find that gets a little bit stale if you read too much of it. Uh, and we do have these kind of chunk habits. It's just, I noticed it. I don't think they are functionally three novellas. I don't think this is a novella, this is a novel, but it, it does definitely chunk down quite nicely. I think I want to touch on the religious aspect of this story because I think that's another one of the big important things. Um, I found it very interesting. It's not a real religion that's being talked about. They talk about the church, they talk about angels, but it is very much in this sort of sci-fi religion setting. Um, and then thus heresy is heresy against that. It's not Christian overtly, which I think is another reason that as like a Joan of Arc retelling, it's interesting because that's so tied to Christianity for me, at least. Reimagining, I should say. But it is very much a commentary, I feel, on religion uh, and on the pervasiveness of religion without being really in, on the nose about what that is. But I, as I say, I mentioned this kind of way of creating religious language that's very easy to parrot and very easy to mimic uh, and religious fervour and guilt and forgiveness and all of this stuff that gets wrapped up in a little a little religion bow in this book, very, very interesting. And I think it's a story that I would happily reread to kind of dig more into that. And I'm hoping that the later books in the series do, because I think um, sci-fi has a tendency to either write very religious societies or very a-religious societies. And I liked that this book kind of does the former, but in a way that society sort of is the religion. It's fascinating. And I do need to do a reread to just kind of get my head around it. So I will be doing that when the next book comes out. That's the plan. I think my biggest problem with this book, the things that hold me back from giving it five stars, the thing that makes me maybe not think everyone would love it, is I did find it quite difficult to get into initially. I think that some of the chapters are very long, so you don't get a lot of breaks, uh, and it's quite a lot of information to be hit with at first. Neon Yang definitely goes for the look, I'm just gonna bombard you with everything, and I'm not gonna explain things, and you'll pick it up as you go, and you'll pick up the context clues and figure it out. I actually really like that for sci-fi, it's been done in a lot of different books. It's a, a way of avoiding doing like 50 info dumps at the beginning of the story, but it does make it a little bit slower to get into. And I think that possibly things got a little bit confusing towards the end. I really felt like the centre of the book was the strongest part and possibly because that's the familiar part to me where we have this more training montage-esque section which is always my favourite thing. So I think the structure of the book overall works, it's just a little bit slow at the beginning and a little bit confusing towards the end. It's also quite a lot of detail to plough through just generally. Um, there's a lot going on, there's a lot of characters, there's a lot of politics happening and a lot of religious language as well that you've just got to churn through. So maybe that might hold some people back. I don't know, perhaps that was just me. Perhaps I was reading it in the wrong mindset. I've been very busy lately. That has an impact. Um, I found that I read kind of the first bit maybe twice uh, and I picked it up and I put it down and I picked it up again. And then the middle I read over a few days. And then I think today, today and yesterday, I read the last 
half, I would say, um, which is not atypical pacing for me. That's That tends to be roughly how it works. But I did find that it felt a little bit slow. For a 300, 400 page book, that would normally take me about a day and a half, and it's taken me maybe a week or so. So this, this I'm looking at the listing. The Nullvoid Chronicles is a story about the nature of truth, the power of belief, and the interplay of both in the stories we tell ourselves. And I do think that that is true to what the books are. Uh, and if that's the the trajectory of the whole series, I think it's going to be very interesting. Uh, and I definitely have that sci-fi first book feeling of, ooh, I want to know more about this. I want to know more about like the background to the religion. I want to know how much of this religion is is true. There's some stuff with AI that's happening that I think is going to be really fascinating in later books. And yeah, overall, I'm excited for future books in the series. I definitely feel similar to the Tensorate series, actually, that this is going to be a thing that's very good as a whole. Uh, the first book is is good, it's fine, it's not exceptional, and I feel like the addition of another couple of books, it's going to make it really, really solid, and they're just going to have a very detailed and immersive world to play in. In terms of comparisons, my obvious sci-fi comparison, and I tend to lean into this, is something like A Memory Called Empire, where you very much have this like fish-out-of-water story, there's a lot of deception, there's a lot of intrigue, there's a lot of politics, uh, and also it's just an exceptional book. I really enjoy that. I recommend looking it up if you haven't read it already. Um, I'm trying to think what else feels very similar in terms of the religious aspect. The only one that's come to mind for me is um, Serafina by Rachel Hartman, which is very, very different in terms of most of the book. But I think that that as a duology, Serafina and Shadowscale, really deals with picking apart the religion on which your world is based, which would be interesting to compare. But I think more after book two, perhaps. I'll have more interesting things to say about those. Overall, I think this is really good. If you're looking for just a book that is Joan of Arc in space, it hits those notes. It is not exactly those notes. Like there are aren't complete allegories for everything. At least maybe I just don't know the Joan of Arc story that well. Maybe I don't know that bit, that bit of history. Amazingly, it didn't feel that way to me. But if you want a uh, chosen holy soldier in space, this will definitely do it for you. And giant space mechs. Yes, I'm always here for space mechs. Iron Widow, another good recommendation. <laughs> Though that's not space. Eh. Right, I'd better move on to the next new release so that I can get a video up for that. Uh, I hope that you enjoyed this video. Have you read this? Do you have plans to? Please do let me know down in the comments below. Uh, if you've got any other sci-fi interesting comments on religion kind of books, I would love to read them. While you're down there commenting, please do subscribe if you haven't already. It makes me feel loved and appreciated, though nothing makes me feel more loved and appreciated than my patrons over on Patreon who support the channel and get early access to videos and bonus content. If you would like to join their number, that's linked down below, as is my Discord and my Twitter if you would like to come have chill chats about books. Thank you so much for watching, that's all from me, and I will see you in the next one. Stand a piece of bloopers now. Welcome back to Dead Good Book Reviews. I'm Judith, and you're watching another episode of. No, no, you're not. The dog's just trying to eat her own butt. Thank you for that. You can't sit there because it's right near the microphone. Go!